So some of you may be wondering why on earth we're still with John the Baptist in this Advent season. Isn't this what the time we're to be looking towards the manger? So why are we dealing with a man that's approximately the same age as Jesus? And why on earth do we have a story about when Jesus was an adult? And why on earth, during Advent, do we have to hear such tough words? I think we all want the baby. We want the manger. And we want to hear good news. Trust me, I've asked some of these very same questions about why we use this text in the lectionary calendar. I've especially questioned why we have this particular text on the day in Advent when we're supposed to be celebrating joy. A week that we're to be reminded that we are to rejoice at all times. And I don't know about you, but this has been a really hard week to find joy. This has been a hard week full of bad news. Of course, it's on a week like this that we have difficult words from John. And this, my friends, is supposed to be good news. Or at least that's what scripture tells us. And good news is something that I thought I knew a lot about. Something that they teach you about in preaching class. You have to know what good news is. You have to know how to deliver the good news. You have to know what your responsibilities are as preacher to bring good news. And when I read this text, all I can think is that if John ever found himself in a seminary class where you're delivering this sermon to a preaching class, he would be in a lot of trouble. I can just hear the students and professors telling him, you know, John, you can't really start out a sermon insulting people. You can't call them a brood of vipers. You just don't do that. You don't insult the people before you preach, right? If you want them to listen to you, then you need to greet them in the name of Jesus Christ. Or perhaps you begin with prayer. But whatever you do, you extend an invitation. You don't burn bridges. And not to mention, I'm sure John had a fiery way of delivering those words and pretty fiery direct attacks on a few people in that crowd that probably made several people uncomfortable. And I know it would make seminary classmates and professors uncomfortable about John's ability to interact with people. I could just hear the professor saying, now John, if you have an anger problem, then we can get you help with that. <laughs> and we'll get you help with it before you perhaps hurt people. And perhaps you need to seek some counseling before we send you before the Board of Ordained Ministry. And maybe we just need to put you into a program at a church where you can do God's work, but you won't be preaching until you work this stuff out. Now, I know you're not going to like it, John, but it's okay. We'll be here with you on the journey. We're doing this out of love for you as our brother. We want you to do well. But it's not just preaching class that struggles with these words from John. I think if we're honest... We do, too. Listen to a letter I found this week written by someone in a community who's read John's words and thinking about them in Advent and is struggling and decided that she perhaps had an insight that could help him have a message well-received. She says, Dear Wild Man, Wilderness Baptizer, here is what you need to know about our world in order to be successful with your message. We are not accustomed to having our noses rubbed in the fact that our motivations for participating in Advent may be corrupt or at least shallow. And in case you need a reference, she says, see Luke 3, chapter, sorry, Luke chapter 3, verse 7. We prefer inhaling the scent of cranberry candles. We are not used to hearing that whether we are ordinary citizens, soldiers, or tax collectors, that we're called to sacrifice in this season and not engage in self-indulgence. And she yet again provides another reference for John, Luke chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. She continues to say, Welcome to our world, John. In our world, preparing for Advent involves practical advice on how to avoid holiday weight gain, how to decorate on a tight budget, how to prevent a gift-giving faux pas at work, and how to whiten your teeth for all of those holiday parties. <laughs> and it's okay, John, if you want to encourage us to give a way to a tot, to put a coin in a red kettle, or to buy a gift for someone in need. You can even urge us to engage in moments of grateful reflection on God's goodness in coming to earth. Remember the old saying, John, 
You get more flies with honey than with vinegar. And she closes the letter there. And if we're honest with ourselves, then we're not the first group of people to struggle with these words from John. Those gathered that day would have struggled to hear the things John said. They struggled to hear that their ancestral belief and connection to God was not good enough if it didn't match their actions. We knew, or we know that they heard the judgmental words because they began to wonder if he was the Messiah, the one who would bring mercy for their souls. I'm sure that there were a lot of bru bruised toes that day, uncomfortable moments, moments where they wished they had stayed at home, moments that they wished they didn't have to live through. But despite all of those moments, despite all the wishes, they were there to bear witness to John's challenge. And how did they respond to his tough words? Does anyone remember from the text? Tell me, how did they respond? They responded with a question. They asked, what is it then we are to do? Perhaps we're to ask the same question today. What is it then that we are to do? Maybe we're to be like John the Baptist. I don't necessarily mean that we have to dress in camel hair or do socially unacceptable things like not take a shower, live in the desert, eat wilderness, or eat locusts and honey. But maybe we're to be like John and welcoming Jesus to the world, welcoming him as a man who came as a baby, one who was baptized with water and the Spirit, to welcome the one who was to spend time with the least of these, to welcome the one who would turn water into wine, the one who would feed the multitude with five loaves and two fishes. The one who would save people from social stigmas from death. One who would teach in the temples even as a child. One who would heal the sick. One who would feed the hungry. One who would free the captives. One who was so bold to eat with tax collectors. One who would make fishers of men. One who would come to turn the world on its head. Perhaps we were to welcome the one who would come to teach us what grace really means. The one who came to break his body for us. The one who would be crucified and resurrected. Maybe we were to welcome the one we call our Savior. The Prince of Peace. One full of mercy and of judgment. The one who John tells us will come with the Holy Spirit. Burning power and a winnowing fork in his hand. See, my friends, when we welcome Jesus, it's going to be uncomfortable. We have to know that the story of welcoming Jesus as a baby is not the same story we think of. <coughs> Ever on Advent, when we have a narrative that we all love to hear. Where it must, we must remember the nativity story is not as pretty as the Christmas movies and the plays portray. The nativity story, my friend, steps on our toes. Like John's words. You must remember that Mary is an unwed teenage mother. She's poor. She's vulnerable on so many levels, but especially under the law. Her pregnancy was one that equated her death by stoning. And we can't forget that although Joseph did a noble thing in allowing his wife not to die, he experienced a social loss. He was perceived now to be the father of a baby out of wedlock. Can you imagine the strain that must have placed on their relationship before they even got married? And can you imagine the pressure that they must have experienced with friends and family? Can you imagine what it would have been like to take your wife, not by choice, to your hometown in a state of third trimester pregnancy? None of their relatives would have room for them because they were pregnant. Even the end didn't have room. They were strangers in a place that should have been home. They were pushed out by those who should have loved them no matter what. Not to mention what it must have been like for Mary to be that pregnant and riding on a donkey. And I don't know if you know how long their journey was, but she traveled 84 miles on the back of the donkey before giving birth. With her husband by her side. And after giving birth, her first visitors were a group of people with enemy be social outcasts. Most of them with criminal records. The shepherds. Their first visitors took a great risk in coming to see Jesus. They gave up their jobs, or at least risked their jobs, to come see the King of Kings. They brought with them their animal steak. Can you just see Mary and Joseph? Here they are, 